Um, good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening, wherever you are. Um, today, we're going to uh, do another one of our tiny ML auto ML tutorials, and today, a deep dive uh, with Qualcomm. Before we start, I'd just like to um, thank some of the companies that make uh, tiny ML org possible, um, particularly our strategic uh, partners. Um, uh, and and to uh, announce a few events that uh, are going to be happening soon. Um, firstly, um, very soon on September the 27th, we're going to have um, a session which is kind of a, a companion session. It's one of the work groups uh, session on neuromorphic um, um, computing, so neuromorphic engineering forum, um, which will be focusing in on neuromorphic architectures. Um, also, um, in uh, next month, uh, October 10th to the 14th, um, we will be having our in-person uh, TinyML EMEA event, um, which is chaired by uh, Francesco Conti. Um, and that will be ha happening in, in Cyprus um, um, between October 10th to the 12th. Um, we also, of course, have um, regular meetups all around the world. Um, uh, there's a lot of members, a lot of different groups in a lot of different countries. You can go and have a look at those uh, meetup places and, and find out where you can uh, attend. And also we have a, a vibrant community on, on, on LinkedIn uh, that you can join. Uh, so we'd encourage you to do that. Um, and also all of our um, past events um, are, are videoed and you can go and find them on our TinyML YouTube channel uh, and subscribe to that so that you get uh, notifications of new uh, recordings. Um, so for this particular talk, um, videos will be posted next week um, on the, the, the YouTube channel. Um, while the presentation is going on, if you have a question, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the uh, um, of the Zoom window. Um, if you can enter in your questions there, uh, then uh, Shirat will ask. Uh, Shirat will answer those at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, so today we're going to have a, a talk from Chirat Patel, um, who works for Qualcomm and is working on the uh, AI model efficiency toolkit, uh, AMET, um, and he's the project lead of that. Um, take it away, Chirat. Uh, thank you, Martin. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, before starting, I would like to thank Tiny ML for giving us an opportunity again. Like uh, we had a roundtable session a month or two back, and now they did follow up deep dive session. Thank you for organizing the event. I think clearly helps spread the message on like uh, how to achieve Tiny ML uh, AI enabling AI at the edge. So thank you again, and uh, I would like to welcome all the participants. Uh, I'm going to talk about AI model efficiency toolkit in general. Uh, we can go through the, you know, like why we are doing that and I'll show you some uh, code examples and whatnot to get you familiar with the, our toolkit of the project itself. Uh, so before the, jumping into AMED itself, right, really like uh, I think the session, if you saw, it's more about auto ML. So auto ML may mean different things to different people. Like uh, if you attended the round table, you saw that, okay, auto ML can be applied at different cities of the workflow. Model designers may think of auto ML as well. So can I optimize my model architecture automatically? Say a neural architecture search. Folks deploying the models onto some edge devices, they will think, okay, how can I automate my process of deploying this or optimizing the models for the end deployment, right? So there are multiple flavors where auto ML comes into play. And then what we are going to talk about is more as the model optimization stage. You have a model or designed by someone, floating point model, you want to take it to uh, edge device, okay, mobile phones, IoT devices, whatnot. How do you optimize them for energy efficiency, improving latency, and so forth? Right? So that's where AMET sort of fits in the overall AutoML workflow. Now, specifically, talk more about like uh, AMET and AMET models. These are our open source projects uh, designed to uh, enable energy efficient AI uh, for the widespread AI deployment. And the project itself are brought uh, to the open source by Qualcomm Innovation Center. And let's understand why we want to do this, right? Like um, AI is everywhere from tiny sensors, like oh, you want to detect people in the room to mobile phones, you are taking cool pictures on it. So autonomous cars are a big rage now, right? So AI is everywhere. Every day the new use cases are emerging, the workloads are 
becoming more and more complex. Like the models themselves, like if you see the parameter counts keep on going up and up. Again, for a good reason, right? They are trying to improve on the accuracy front, enable new functionalities. At the same time, like the requirements for these workloads keep on increasing. Everyone wants to do real time stuff, always on stuff. Right? So this poses big challenge, especially on when you talk about uh, mobile devices or tiny ML kind of IoT devices. Clearly, the memory is precious on these devices. And everyone knows that okay, the price that you have to pay when you go from one like a uh, uh, skew for a mobile phone with some memory to a higher one, right? Battery life is more even more precious. You want your phone to last longer and longer, or like you are plugged in an IoT device somewhere, you want a very long life so that you don't have to worry about replacing the batteries so very frequently. So especially uh, this energy efficiency is critical for mobile environment or the tiny ML or edge AI devices. And we need to keep in mind, oh, because you, the, the designers may design very complex models, but how do you make sure that these models run efficiently on the edge devices? And that is where, like Qualcomm, I am part of Qualcomm AI research. Uh, Qualcomm AI research and Qualcomm are leading in the industry in driving this efficient uh, edge inference. A lot of our focus is on like condensation and compression. We will hear more about that as we go along. We have like uh, industry leading research on this front. A lot of our papers have been well recognized in top tier conferences, right? And they span a gamut of activities. Like we, we focus on a, a holistic research areas like from condition, compression, to compiler optimization, and whatnot. And here I'm just showing a snippet of some of the research, right? Like uh, on condition front. We have enabled like condition with the limited data or a very uh, even data free in some scenarios through data free condition. Adaptive rounding, another paper I'll talk about a bit more later, like uh, optimize this uh, for models further in a post training manner. Recently, did a transformer condition as well. Right? So, that there are a lot of this uh, innovation that we are bringing in. And then ultimately, what happens is we bring this you know, full innovation, the research into uh, product. Or like uh, the AMET product, uh, and then we also have accompanying AMET models uh, for the same. <clears throat> so why worry about fixed point inference, quantizing the models, uh, and I can uh, try to motivate why. Right? Typically, when you design the networks, they are trained in 32-bit floating point. Uh, now, let's say we want to deploy on uh, them on device. Can we reduce the model size? Condition is a one clear choice. You can go to eight bit condition, for example. Clearly, the model size reduces by one foot. But more importantly, what happens is when you have right set of uh, uh, hardware accelerators designed to leverage this, you can get significant benefits in terms of the performance. Like, for example, compared to 32 bit floating point inference, you can get up to 16x improvement in performance per watt or uh, when you do 6.8 bit inference. You can even take it down further. Oh, what about four bits? Can I do four bits? Yeah, you can do four bits, right? So that will give further energy improvement or performance for what improvement. So that is really the key driver. Why we strongly believe, okay, this is the way to go for the edge inference. The fixed point is the way to go. I think just yesterday we had a webinar. I'd like to just give a shout out. We had a webinar yesterday. Talking about AMET bit in general, but more importantly, our whole view on okay, what should what is the right choice for uh, edge inference? Compare, contrast, result with floating point versus fixed point. A lot of industry work lately on enabling new fixed point formats. Are they really needed? What are the pros and cons? What's like what are the trade-offs when you do fixed point inference with 8 bit? And we are clearly able to show that oh, fixed point inference is on par with floating point, and even uh, in terms of accuracy and considerably better when you talk about energy efficiency and so forth, right? So that, that, that is really the motivation in uh, the, uh, like why we are the, after this and to. So I think some of you may not be completely familiar, okay, what does it mean to contact a neural network, right? So this slide is trying to give a high level picture for that. Typically you will have an input, let's say very simple network convolution, ReLU, you have the bar weights and then the intermediate outputs where the activations are available here. When you do fixed point inference, you want to quantize all the operations and the underlying arithmetic. 
So you want to store the weights in uh, dual precision. So you will quantize these weights. You want to quantize the activation outputs and then do the arithmetic. For example, when you do the multiplication like um, so for the convolution layer uh, and you either do the addition of biases and whatnot, you want that whole arithmetic to run in fixed point. So you need to quantize the weights, the intermediate uh, uh, outputs that you get and then continue the workflow uh, in a fixed point engine. So during quantization of neural network, what we typically do, like uh, at least in the simulation, right, when you're trying to optimize the model for quantization, you will have this uh, original graph for the model, a floating point pytorch model, a tensor model, or you will have a convolution layer defined in pytorch and ReLU and whatnot. You will insert some quantization nodes in between. Like I had, I had, for example, at the weight in uh, floating, take the floating point weights, do some quantization uh, additional node or operation you can think of in insertion or fake count nodes is what they're typically called. We insert them after the weights in the graph. Similarly, you do the same for the activation and then do the necessary optimization process uh, to make the model more and more quantization friendly. So, and why you want to make the model quantization friendly? Uh, Quantization is great. I should talk about the benefits, right? Like it can give you significant energy efficiency. It has some challenges as well. Okay, here we are showing a floating point FP32 model a segment, a semantic segmentation use case. The left is what you will get on a model that was trained and uh, in floating point and running in floating point for instance as well. But if you just blindly did a eight bit quantization for this model, right? You can see some artifacts or inaccuracies appearing in the segmentation map. For example, this person is, you can see the segmentation map is okay, but the person in the background suffers, right? Like that, that person does not get segmented correctly. You want to get the best possible answer and as close as possible answer because to the floating point because that was the model designer's intent, right? So that's, so this is clearly the challenge for foundation and then just naively doing things is not going to cut it. And that's where AMET comes in. So what is AMET really, right? Like, uh, so AMET is a library of a state-of-the-art conduction and compression algorithms or techniques uh, that I mentioned earlier came in coming out of Qualcomm AI research. Typically, the way the AMET works is you have a TensorFlow or PyTorch model. The user can then, you know, within the existing pipeline, call the AMET library and quantize the model with the average. The output will again be a PyTorch TensorFlow model, but with more quantization friendly model. And then you can deploy it on your own device, whether it's like a mobile phone, IoT devices, and whatnot. So the workflow is pretty simple in that sense. So let, let us uh, take a look at the features at a high level, right? Um, so on the quantization front, and that is a lot of our emphasis, even throughout the talk, it's on quantization, because we believe that is the really the way to go to optimize the models uh, for deployment and especially for energy efficiency. We have techniques giving state-of-the-art integer eight, uh, integer four performance. We have post-training condition methods, and then uh, I'll maybe talk in a bit uh, what does post-training mean if you don't have context, and then condition aware training techniques. We also have compression techniques, uh, you know, hard of channel pruning, tensor decomposition techniques. We support those as well. Then to complement them, we have some visualization analysis tools, like what we have so recently we introduced a feature of Cont Analyzer to analyze, okay, how do, what is the model behavior to quantization, which layers that can be are more sensitive to quantization, which weights are quantization sensitive activations and whatnot, right? So we can give all that analysis to the user to get deeper insights into the uh, model behavior itself if need be. And what do these features really bring, right? So clearly, foundation brings a lot of benefits in terms of power saving, um, saving the memory, not just memory for the storage of the weights for the model itself, but even when you do all the processing, moving the data back and forth from, uh, to, from the processor to the external memory, then significant saving in the memory bandwidth, which will tra again translate to less power requirement. The AMET brings all these benefits, but with one critical piece, right, which is maintaining the accuracy, uh, which I showed was it can be challenging for with quantization. So AMET gets you get both best of the both worlds, so get the good accuracy and also get the latency energy benefits on the other hand. <clears throat> so just to give more color to 
Um, so what kind of penetration techniques we had, I briefly mentioned. So broadly, the techniques fall into two buckets, post-training condition and condition aware training. A post-training condition, what we mean is you have, you have floating point 32 model. To convert it uh, directly into a fixed point model, uh, you don't need the original training pipeline. A lot of times, like depending on who you talk to, some of the, there are like teams where you just focus on designing the networks, and then there are deployment team who will want to deploy the networks. And then the, the deployment team may not have all the training data and whatnot. Right? So the posting techniques can come into picture in those kind of scenarios. Uh, again, if you don't have, uh, yeah, and then posting techniques, the other advantage is they work with small data set, unlabeled data set, or you can be data free in some cases. Uh, that's uh, more simpler to use, like some simple API calls will get you the job done. But then they may not get you the best possible accuracy necessarily as good as the conduction of a training. So conduction of a training itself is really, typically you are training a model, right? So QAT will, is really fine tuning some more epochs uh, of, uh, on the model to make it more conduction friendly. It does require the, the name implies, right? Fine tuning will imply it will need training data and the label data itself. You don't need to run the as many epochs as you did originally for the original training, but you still need to do some epochs of the optimization with fine tuning. So there are a bit longer training times compared to the post-training condition, but still it's quite fast compared to the more training models from scratch. There may be some need for hyperbolic tuning as well. That we given uh, the, that's the nature of fine tuning really. Right? But if you are willing to go through uh, like uh, put a bit more effort, and especially for demanding use cases or challenging model scenarios, yeah, QAT does get you higher accuracy. And also it can help you to push down the bit width. You can go from eight bits to even four bits with QAT. Right? So clearly QAT has its place in the workflow for the, uh, for the optimization. And then what AMED does is uh, AMED is a complete package offering both PTQ and QAT techni uh, techniques to address different reads depending on what the user can do, cannot do, and the amount of time they have, resources they have, and so forth. <clears throat> I'm going to show some proof points really, okay, what kind of performance you can get uh, using AMED. So I'm just highlighting here a technique called adaptive rounding, add -around. Typically when you Talk about condition, right? Like let's say eight bit condition with a grid of ranging from minus one twenty seven to one twenty eight. If the floating point say weight was here, right? Like the view dot represents the floating point weight, you will round up to the nearest grid point. But that's not necessarily always the best scenario, or the okay, that gets you the best accuracy. So what we our researchers did was they asked this fundamental question: or like, can we do rounding bit more differently? Okay, is there a better way? And the answer is yes. So you can do adaptive rounding. And a, this is a use case that I, for an object detection uh, scenario. You can see the MAP score with the floating point was 82 or so. If you just did like plainly nearest rounding, the model is quite sensitive to contradiction. The MAP score drops significantly. But if you use a much adaptive rounding technique, add around technique, uh, using 8-bit weights and 8-bit activities, so you can recover back the performance. It essentially as close as uh, like to the floating point, like one percent drop or so is typically tolerable for this kind of use cases. And yeah, and so you can meet the accuracy challenge using image techniques, uh, giving you a bit more like a qualitative view, like okay, why this matters. So this is like a real world use case, ADAS application. You, the car, you, you want to detect all the objects on the road. If you did just the baseline quantization with nearest rounding, you can see here this picture right on the uh, topmost that there are issues with the here like this middle vehicle it's not detected at all. There is some misclassification on the other vehicles which can affect the path planning and other algorithm that will run downstream for ADAS kind of use cases. So that's where and if you see adaptive rounding to your result, it's pretty good. You can detect all the vehicles, their classes are correct, like this car, car is clearly identified, all the other vehicles, even in the background, right? Which are a bit more challenging, even they can be correctly identified and labeled. So that, that shows you the power of uh, image of add -around. And again, add around a post training foundation technique. So again, uh, these are additional results. Uh, uh, this was done using uh, 
uh, a mix of like a posturing foundation and we also had some other results on qat i show you that as well but i showed this picture earlier right like fp32 was the inter emet condensation so what is like the baseline condensation clearly the we saw earlier the baseline condensation was missing this segmentation map and now with the emet condensation techniques we are able to recover that uh, uh, performance and uh, the, both the people are correctly segmented and the performance is awesome here So there are a bunch of techniques uh, available uh, within AMH, like for posturing itself, like uh, cross layer equalization. I didn't uh, discuss in detail. Adaptive rounding. We also have some ability to do mix precision and so forth. So the, then, as part of the automated workflow, we went a step ahead and said, okay, can we just do something smarter? Like we don't want people to struggle through. Oh, can i try do i need to try this technique versus this technique what will work better on depends on different model scenarios right so the so we introduced a feature called auto font auto font simplify the post tuning condition like the intent is to make it simpler more push button black box optimization for in a post tuning region so the user will have its model uh, they can prepare the model through some of the apis they might will have i'll show some more details now after this slide internally auto font will do all the necessary step required for example batch norm folding is required typically for inference it does that automatically it will analyze the model characteristics in detail apply the right set of techniques cross layer equation adaptive rounding or your mixed position and finally get you the best possible content uh, model and also some associated report with it or oh, this is what it did these are the issues and what not right? but the, this is clearly going towards more and more automation and like the kind of thing we have today on auto ml it's an auto con and those kind of techniques fit in from ml uh, so i'll stop on the presentation of the slide where and then i want to jump to actually uh, help you understand the work to excel for the ml so i'll pull up a jupyter notebook uh, here So this is a GPN notebook. We are going to make it available for this soon on the AMET GitHub as well, uh, or an equivalent of this for uh, everyone to use. So what we are showing here is an example for an HRNet, which is a popular model and is actually used for a segmentation use case. Uh, I want to give a sense of okay, what does it take for you to use AMET really, right? Like uh, and then this GPN notebook will be available. There are some other GPN notebooks already available in the AMET GitHub. I'll talk about those as well so that we can get started uh, soon. So the workflow will be okay. You have a floating point model. You load the model. This is like evaluating the model. Okay, what is the model performance in SP32 regime, right? Like if you didn't do quantization, yeah, the segmentation maps are pretty good. Uh, this is what you want. But now we go through the quantization. Uh, what happened? Let, let's just focus on first doing a naive quantization without any aim at optimization and see what happens in this scenario, right? So you can do, I think this is just like, yeah, you can do prepare a model in AMS. So we have a model of preparer functionality in AMS. So this, that makes a model compatible to AMS and also transforms the model. The way if you had original PyTorch model, it will transform that original model. Again, in the PyTorch land itself, the model does not change. The model format, everything remains the same. It will do some conversions, convert some uh, functions to modules. Or if there are some like addition operations that, uh, that we need to quantize, it will try to automatically make uh, replace them with modules, and then AMET will insert quantization nodes that I talked about earlier. So that's what AMET will do. And then it's very pretty simple. I think you can also look at the APIs here, right? Like okay, one shot API prepare model, the model gets prepared really. Right? Once you have the model prepared, uh, then you Okay, call this condition simulation one. This is where the actually uh, the condition nodes uh, get inserted into the original PyTorch model. You can say so you pass in the floating point model. You will specify okay what kind of scheme you want. Constant post training condition uh, here in particular one just TFE like a baseline plain vanilla condition scheme. No real optimization. You specify the bit width that you care for. Embed is quite flexible in the trigger. You can do 16-bit condition. Uh, or you can do mix and match. You want weight to be 8-bit context, you can set that. You want outputs to be 16-bit context, you can set that. So there's a lot of flexibility uh, available for you to experiment and optimize the model. After this, you will do some calibration. Like by calibration is, okay, 
given this model and some data set for calibration, okay, the model uh, AMET needs to figure out what should be my foundation parameters for each and every parameter, like the weight, para weight tensor, the activation tensor in the network. So it does that through this calibration scheme. Uh, so again, you need to pass a calibration data loader. It can come from your existing data loaders or some trimmed down version of that area. Right? And that's what we typically recommend. And finally, you eval the score, right? You know, again, you do eval dot model. And what you're passing here is really sim dot model, which was the output of the foundation simulation model. So, so think of again, if you step back the steps at broad high level was you had a floating point model, you prepared the model in a with a single API call, the model prepared uh, this API call. You created a contact simulation model to now assess what will be the contact accuracy look like. Now that is this object, the same object. And then you are then from the, that becomes your go to model going forward. Really, right? that this because this contains all the necessary information, the foundation nodes, and everything. And you just operate on that network going forward. Again, you can call your original evaluation uh, uh, function and so forth. There's no need to modify your existing data loader or your evaluation functions uh, when you're dealing with the post training foundation technique. And same is true for when you're dealing with QAT. I'll get to that later. But you just pass the sim dot model here, and then you can get an accuracy score. And you can see there's some drop in MIOU score here, right? Earlier the floating point number was in the 80s. If I yeah, it was in the 81 or so. And he, he, here you are you seeing a three four percentage drop here, right? So 77, 78, and that manifests into uh, like uh, if you look at the segmentation map, there are things that may be missing, like a sign here is missing, some pedestrian here is missing. So, so the point being, yeah, the condensation will incur this um, accuracy drop if you do it a very plain vanilla condensation. Here, Emmet didn't do any optimization yet, right? Emmet just inserted the condensation nodes to assess, okay, what is the sensitivity of this model to condensation? Luckily, this model is not that sensitive. Sometimes we have seen the model completely break down, really, right? You, you will see all garbage uh, when you condense for a lot of the times. So now let, let's see what can AMET do, right? So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have some analysis, visualization tools as well. The content analyzer is that. Uh, I'll skip the content analyzer for time being. We can come to it if there are questions, uh, interest. But I want to highlight more on the autocon front. So autocon, as I mentioned, it automates the post training condition workflow, right? You have a condition simulation model, or you start with a floating point 32 model, and then it will do everything underneath for the user. So the workflow at high level is take floating point 32 model, apply the background folding, cross hair equalization, and all the other steps really, right? And at the output, you will get a return of quantized optimized model. And if you look at the APIs, they're pretty straightforward and simpler. Okay, you call the autocon functionality, you import the autocon module or function from the AMET, you create this object. What you are passing is really a few parameters. What is my tolerable accuracy drop, right? Or in this case, we just configure zero. I don't want to take any accuracy drop. Uh, just keep in mind, yeah, you don't necessarily get that. It all depends on like the what kind of model, how sensitive the model is, and especially with the post training condition, right? But it's just for the illustration purposes. And then there are like other regular parameters like the condition scheme you want to use, and then the parameter bit bits and so forth. Right. And, and then uh, ultimately, yeah, again, they, you also have to co configure some of these add around parameters. But th th this comes as default, really. We are just showing it here. You don't need to necessarily mess around with that. So it's just for illustration purposes. And then you call this like uh, autocon.apply on the original model. And uh, that's it, really, right? It goes through the process. So ideally, you think of this way. Which, you could have bypassed all the other steps if you didn't care about like oh, oh, now condition and all those. Really, this becomes your workflow, right? Like, okay, you have a floating point model here. I have an autocon object and I just say, okay, go apply autocon, get me the best possible post training condition answer. And that it's as simple as this really, right? Like uh, that shows the power of more and more automation that we're bringing in it. And underneath, once you call this, it's going to run through a bunch of steps, so batch norm folding, blah, 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 cross layer equalization and whatnot, right? And then finally, you will get an answer really like, okay, uh, you'll get an optimized model at the end, like, uh, right? Yeah, add around finished and stuff. Uh, and then what happens is, 
Okay, now you again got a simulation object like with the context in node itself. Okay, and now you can do the evaluations and whatnot. Right? So, so you pass the sim dot model into your existing evaluation function. And look at what is the score. This is my uh, finally the score. We clearly improved it like that, that three, four percent drop earlier uh, got improved. And we are much closer to the floating point performance now, right? So there it was like 81.1 something, and then now we are at 80.7 or 8. So pretty good. And Autocon did its job uh, as we expected. And you can even see, like, if you look at the segmentation map, all the artifacts that I mentioned earlier, they, they go away, right? Like, we are able to detect all this traffic signs, even though the background, uh, uh, it's blending in the background, we are able to detect it correctly as expected in the floating point uh, model itself. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, th th that's really what I will show on the autocon side of things. Like, uh, I would encourage everybody, yeah, if you are going for post and quantization and using game, like, yeah, autocon is the way to go. And again, as I mentioned, we are going to release uh, this Jupyter notebook on equivalent pretty soon for everyone to use it as well. So let's go back to the slides. Uh, so I talked about post and quantization a bit. Uh, and then like, this is just to give a higher architecture and I'm going to switch gears to foundation of training. So at the, at the underneath, at, at its core, like uh, the, all the algorithms within AMAT are encapsulated in library. And then what happens is like uh, the library interfaces with like the PyTorch or TensorFlow through some APIs. The input will be a PyTorch TensorFlow model. The output again is a model in you know, a PyTorch or TensorFlow format. And we can even do exports to like uh, Onyx and whatnot. So that is also supported. And the APIs themselves are pretty, uh, and you also already saw, right? Like uh, they are quite straightforward, user friendly, like few API calls without worrying about the underlying details. They are able to apply lots of technique. And the picture on the right here shows exactly that. Like, uh, and this is for a foundation aware training, the QAT pipeline. Often we think, say, here, um, it's okay. Is QAT going to completely, I will have to rejig my whole training pipeline or whatnot? And the answer is no. It seamlessly fits into your existing workflow or the pipeline. Uh, you can think of, okay, on the left, uh, this is your typical uh, model training workflow. You have PyTorch model, you have a triple tra training function, you have a URL function, you have a data loader as well between two, but yeah, clearly you have these three core components, right? data loader, training function, evaluation function, and so forth. Now, how, how does the AMET work here? Right? So what AMET will do as uh, part of the QAD workflow, to take this PyTorch model again, the floating point model, you call the uh, the consumer you uh, functionality that I just described in the autocon work uh, uh, Jupyter notebook. The output is a context and simulation model. Again, it's a PyTorch model, no change. And then the rest of the flow continues. You don't need to change anything to your training function, evaluation function. Just pass this new context and simulation model, and the workflow continues as is really right. So. It's pretty simple. It integrates seamlessly into the existing pipeline. And there are some Jupyter notebooks also available uh, on our GitHub. So let me quickly show you some of those as well and help you understand how, how do you navigate uh, the resources we have the GitHub. So bring those that very here. <clears throat> Let's see. So first of all, I want to show you the Qualcomm GitHub page itself. You go here, sorry, uh, my bad. Yeah, so this is our, you can go to github.com slash quick slash amet. Uh, you'll see a bunch of resources on the GitHub, like uh, we have some results for our example results. Uh, I talk more about some of those here as well. But there are some resources here, like a user guide. You can click through, you go, it will take you to the detailed documentation we have. Example code, there are some tutorial videos. So we are working to refresh them again as we go bring in new features and so forth. But the existing videos are also pretty good to get you started. And then the example code and uh, will take you to some links to Jupyter notebooks, or you can directly go here actually, right? The examples. And then you will see examples for both PyTorch and TensorFlow. And if I go to one of the folder here, so let's say example, sorry, um, Torch, Quantization, 
and you can see like a bunch of Jupyter notebooks here, like uh, there's an autocon Jupyter notebook uh, built on the lines of like, oh, I think, yeah, so we just uploaded here. It's similar to what I just showed, right? So that, that will help you get to the whole post training workflow. We just care to uh, apply only one or uh, one feature standalone. You can do that as well, add around it, it is one notebook for static collection. And we have notebooks for connection of our training itself. So let me show you the Q81 to uh, help you understand like the picture I was showing you earlier, right? Like uh, how seamlessly it can integrate into the workflow. <clears throat> so again, like uh, this is an example. So think of like, this is your training pipeline. You'll have a data loader, you'll have a error function, you'll have a fine tune function, right? This is like, yeah, this an example we have created, but equivalently you will have, the user will have the same on their pipeline. That stays as is. You load the model, you prepare the model through AMET, as I mentioned earlier. It does some uh, model modifications for making it uh, like to ensure that contraction nodes can be inserted at the correct place. So that when you want to take it to the target, you get the right expected behavior. And then ultimately, like, yeah, I think um, again, the same thing, create contraction simulation model. You already saw this. So it's very pretty standard workflow, whether you post in contraction or contraction over training. And then to just do QAT itself, oh, this was an original fine tune function, right? You just call it, right? Uh, pass in the hyperparameter that you would typically pass. And you, uh, the key is to pass in the connection simulation model that we created. Typically, you would have passed the original floating point model. Now you are passing the fine tune model. And then to, again, once the fine tuning uh, completes, you want to evaluate the model accuracy. Yeah, you, you continue to use your original evaluation function. So it, that, that's about it, right? Like you can see no changes are really needed into the APIs to call into uh, their existing functions. So I hope that that uh, motivates you like, okay, um, how AMET can help you solve the uh, condition needs in a very say, seamless manner. Uh, this was an example on the PyTorch side. Uh, we have other resources here on the TensorFlow as well. Like you can go to uh, TensorFlow. Similarly, you will see TensorFlow notebooks. Uh, we are starting to recently support KM more on Keras support. So you can see Keras notebook here as well. So there, there are a lot of resources to help you get started with it. So I think that that, that is my main message here. So in the interest of time, let's switch gears and continue forward with the slides. So uh, this talks about uh, transformer contraction. So transformers are gaining more and uh, more popularity. Uh, they started from the NLP task, and now we see more and more uh, use cases in the vision domain as well. And then often transformer contraction is considered challenging, right? Like uh, you know, we tackle that challenge. I'm glad to say, okay, now AMET supports transformer contraction as well. Uh, here we are showing some results for like uh, but uh, digital but just kind of my NLP model. With contention aware training, we can get good performance, integer rate performance. Uh, this VIT model uh, here, uh, the vision transformer to popular model. Even for the vision transformer, we can see here, we only did post training contention. Just want to remind you, like, oh, so some of these results were with QAT. This result is with post training contention. Uh, here we did mistration actually, right? Like to show that, okay, uh, you can get away with post training and mistration as well. For even this challenging models, and like and then you can you can further optimize the performance that you can bring down the bits clearly if you did QAT, right? As we show here for the uh, BERT and digital BERT and all those kind of models where the entire model is running in take. So yeah, we can context called transformers and then payment techniques can handle a broad set of use cases. So then let's talk about the AMET models, right? So AMET itself is a tool uh, collection of uh, techniques. So now to complement it, we have released AMET models itself. Uh, AMET model do is a collection of pre-trained eight-bit content models covering different use cases. Uh, so I can show you quickly on the GitHub as well again. Uh, so this is our model zoo here. You can go to model zoo. I think the models are available for here to everyone to use. So what we have here is like, some 20 odd models, 20, 25 models right now. And then we are continuously building the, bringing in more and more models and use cases into the model. So you can see models here, like the 
we have pre we have documentation we have some pre and uh, checkpoints available so for example mobile net here you can see you can download this quantize model and use it to your, your use cases you, you can use some of these models as your backbones or you can directly use them or as when you are using a backbones feature extractors you can fine tune by integrating them into your existing uh, use cases so these are some of the model five tens of the models we have popular use cases are models for pytorch as well like mobile and v2 rest nights deep lab v3 pose estimation and so forth right so you know i'll talk about super resolution in a bit but as you see like there's a lot of good stuff available here and then the key is we have published results you should be able to reproduce these results as well like uh, we have some uh, instructions if you go to the documentation but all these models that you good accuracy relative to the floating point 32 models so yeah and then uh, this is like what i started telling earlier in the accuracy front right? like uh, you saw the collection of models accuracy can be challenging uh, when you talk about a lot of use cases especially like uh, challenging use cases like uh, segmentation and super resolution and so forth but we we have uh, we have proof points and uh, models available for everyone to use uh, readily and uh, that get uh, you know, good accuracy and uh, this is like uh, super resolution is a very interesting use case right like uh, everyone probably is familiar with like uh, mobile photography a lot of super resolution comes into picture there it's gaining more and more uh, prevalence in like uh, gaming xr use cases data use cases uh every, every pixel matters for super resolution right some people want to get with good visual quality in here we, we through our super resolution models to it uh, that is available on the open trust we have offered to several different models a different accuracy of the psnr uh, uh, points and different complexity so people can pick and choose depending on their needs and their use case but the overall our point is so you can even quantize this kind of challenging use cases using gamut and then the models are available for everyone to use and try them out uh, on the models uh, uh, lastly again uh, we went through some of these resources uh, so you, i give you a tour of the gamut github the models itself we also released a white paper on, it's available on archive uh, think of it as a practical guide to get started on gamut uh, it's a short read it gives, gives a uh, some overview of the condition itself Uh, to get you a bit familiar with the nuances symmetric quantization asymmetric quantization the other thing that you want to care about when you are doing quantization and then again yeah, it talks more about how do you invoke the quantization techniques the workflow itself and so forth so i encourage you to explore this uh, resources you have made available and then yeah we'll love to get your feedback as well on the open source forum and so forth and you can even reach out to us directly also so that's perfectly fine Uh, with that, I will uh, stop here. Uh, we have only 15 minutes for the Q and A, so yeah, I'll stop here and then uh, glad to, to take any questions. There's already some questions which have been uh, which have been posed in the question and answer group. Sure, uh, I can that. take them some of them. So, okay, so I think the first question, I think we might still use one dot x sessions. uh we recently have introduced 2.x as well so i would uh, encourage you to check it out and if you see any issues please feel free to to reach out but we do now start supporting 2.x there may be some fallback to 1.15 when needed but yeah 2.x support is there uh, the next question is there any comparison of quantization performance of feature set between m8 and tensor to light conversion tool uh thank you andre for the question uh, great question Uh, we have some internal comparisons available uh, and again uh, i don't want to rather give the message that oh, one tool is better or another really but we clearly believe amet does have the right set of techniques like tensorflow they they do support post training quantization quantization aware training uh, but the algorithms we have and then backed by our papers we issue the sota results the state of the art results uh, they may not be there in all the other native frameworks right so we 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 still feel uh, that amet should be the choice especially when you are talking about like uh, deploying on lot of the edge devices with qualcomm the uh, uh, hardware and accelerators and so forth right okay so the next question 
Currently, the AMET content simulation model can be deployed using call from LTK DLC models only. Is there any way to export them to other than DLC for deployment? Uh, and again, another great question. So, but maybe first, I would like to say that's not completely true. Think of the AMET is hardware agnostic, really. Like, uh, as I mentioned, you do the optimization, you are still getting a PyTorch model out, or you are getting an Onyx model out, right? You can deploy that Onyx model to other targets, really, right? Uh, there may be some deltas, uh, or no, you may not get the full functionality, but there's nothing that says, oh, like the output of AMET has to be tied to the DLC that you're talking about for the Qualcomm SDK. Uh, that's not necessarily true, uh, yeah. Uh, next question. Are you planning on integrating other techniques to AMET to reduce computational costs, such as knowledge installation, early exit, network sparsity? Uh, great question again. Uh, thank you for asking. Um, we are constantly looking to add new features. Uh, and again, you know, what, what drives what we bring into our feature set is largely what we see is really the right choice. Like it's also at some point becomes a philosophical question also like, oh, does sparsity buy you more or like condition actually buys you more? And we do believe that oh, like if you did condition correctly, I think that buys you more. Uh, especially you, you can even do four bit condition. I mentioned to a webinar yesterday that myself and one of our top researchers did from Qualcomm. We, we showed results, we great results with integer four condensation. Slowly, slowly, integer four will become more prevalent. It will even beat out a lot of sparsity stuff and so forth. So that's why we are not focusing too much on the knowledge distillation, those kind of techniques that clearly uh, we can add them into image, but think of that way like oh, the users may already have some knowledge distillation baked into their pipelines. So that's why we are not completely focusing on those kind of techniques. But slowly, slowly, I think you will see more and more functionalities like this coming in. So it becomes more and more automated. This will become more of a one-stop shop if you want to think of it that way. Right? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so I'll go to the next question. So performance looks impressive on compute vision use case. Are you tell you to for audio ML use cases. Uh, again, uh, thank you for the question. Very nice question. Uh, CV use cases are great. I've started showing transformer models, uh, NLP use cases. And if you see on the models, you uh, you see a deep speech, which is more of an audio ML use case, if you want. We have done that uh, for uh, on the, those kind of use cases as well. But clearly not extensive, but uh, we, we are comfortable and confident based on our internal results and also like some of the proof points are available on the models. Zoo, that yeah, there's no reason to believe it does not work for uh, uh, the, the, this kind of audio ML use case. Okay, so is condition techniques only for classical data? Is it relevant for regression tasks? Uh, again, a very nice question. Uh, you know, clearly, think of like uh, it matters for regression tasks as well, uh, not just for classification. Um, the super resolution I talked about is uh, in some sense a regression or technically it's like more of an image to image use case. But there are use cases where even you have to do regression, right? So it's relevant as long as you are running the regression task onto an fixed-point accelerator, condition is required. There is no other choice really, right? So you have to do that. And then the regression task can be often a bit more challenging for condition. But that's where like things like condition over training and image portioning conditions come into picture so to get you that right accuracy. Looks like we've got to the end of the questions. Correct. Yeah, uh, feel Any... free. Anyone can. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, there's, there's can another one. Any... Yes. Another sure. one. Last one. Okay, so when it comes to deployment in embedded frameworks that TF light, does they might introduce any potential incompatibilities? Uh, I cannot answer that uh, frankly. Uh, we have not gone through, through that path. But again, as I mentioned, right, like the, for example, the output will again be uh, answer to optimized model. TF light will do its own condition optimization. So there may be incompatibility in that trigger, right? So if you are going through a MET workflow, then yeah, you may not need to need to maybe just bypass the TF light condition functionalities perhaps, and then it should work right? because the endpoint is still from a is still a TensorFlow model, right? So, but uh, frankly, we, we are not tried that paths on our side. Any more questions? <laughs>
Well, I'll be very selfish and add a question myself. Um, <laughs> Jack, um, so when you when you're actually modifying the model with the quantized version, are you actually how are you doing that? Are you inserting your own operations, which are quantized operations, or are you using fake quantizers around operations? I think so. We are introducing fake quantizers there around the operations. Really, that's how it is. Like think of like a convolutional layer was there. We are putting a wrapper node around it. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shai. Uh, um, so just just before we leave, um, I'd just like to thank again our, our strategic partners um, who who really make this this whole um, community possible, um, particularly executive strategic partners, Arm, uh, Edge Impulse, Qualcomm that we have from for today, Sentient, and our platinum strategic partners, Deep Light, uh, Click Attack, Reality AI. Renesas, Sony, and our gold strategic partners, Analog Devices, PhotoHub, Microsoft, NXP, Seed Studio, SenseML, ST, Synaptics, and Synsense, and our silver strategic partners that you can see on this slide. And I'd like to thank you all for attending today and, uh, and see you next time. Thank you.